Hey folks, it's Matt once again, and welcome back to another review, this time of The Road Warrior. Which, I don't understand why this has not gotten a special edition. I believe there's a Blu-ray set with the first three movies that maybe has a commentary, I could be wrong. But I know, even the first film it got, this film recently got a collector's edition from Screen Factory, yet The Road Warrior still gets really nothing. And it's easily, for me, the best Mad Max film. You could argue the only good Mad Max film. At least I, I would argue that. At least to me. <clears throat> this. And for the longest time, I'm like, you know, is it really that great? And I had a DVD before and even gave it to my friend Afri because I know he was a big fan of the movie. Because I'm like, I watched this a lot growing up, but there were other action movies that I just enjoyed more. Cobra, Hard Target, you know, like these other movies I enjoyed more. And talking about Mel Gibson, I was always a bigger fan of Lethal Weapon than Mad Max. <clears throat> Lethal Weapon series than the Mad Max series. And there's other Mel Gibson films I like. Maverick, Conspiracy Theory, Bird on a Wire I don't mind. <clears throat> Tequila Sunrise I saw once. And I barely remember it other than Kurt Russell was in it. But watch this again. I have no problems with this movie when I watch this again. I... This is a damn good movie. This is a damn good film. You know, after watching these first three Mad Max films at the same time, a lot of films, action films nowadays... Uh, there is a reason why this became a classic. Um, even just the way the tiles open, which they did a decent job in the first Mad Max, but I just love the way the titles in The Road Warrior, you know, The Road Warrior, just the sort of glimmer of the title. And I love the music by Brian May. He did a great job on this music, just really pulls you in, works very well in the action scenes. I'm doing a, sh do a shitty job with it. This deserves a special edition, for fuck's sake. It deserves it. I don't know what the fuck the problem is. And I even love the narration. I thought the narrator, they picked a good job with the voice for the narrator, which is the beginning and end of the film. And... I don't think any of the other Mad Max films had narration. This is the only one that had narration. The only one. Which you find out later on is the Pharaoh Kid. Which I thought that was kind of a cool idea. But even the narration I liked about how they summed up the war, what happened, how you know the people talked and talked and talked. And like I said in my review of the first Mad Max, this is the one that I always watched the most growing up. And for the longest time I did not know there was a Mad Max. I just thought there was the Road Warrior. And of course it was named that because... They figured at the time the first Mad Max wasn't that popular in America. So, made this film as if it was his own title wise. But in other places, it's called Mad Max 2. In fact, if you go on YouTube, you can look up trailers and it will say Mad Max 2. But I like The Road Warrior. I like that title better. I like it just being called The Road Warrior. It's a, I can't have just an excellent title. He's The Road Warrior. And the beginning of the film where it sums up the first movie, that's that's also a reason why I'm not the biggest fan of the film. I'm like, I could just watch the the summation in this movie and get a couple of the cool stunts and what happened and then go on to the rest of the movie. I mean, I could just watch those couple minutes. And this is just, to me, a superior sequel. It's a more exciting film. I never got bored with it. it. Has a great score. It has memorable villains, Lord Humongous with that sort of uh, not really hockey mask, but that sort of mask that he wears. Kind of like if you remember the Friday the Thirteenth Part Five VHS cover. That's the mask he has. And Vernon Wells as Wes. I believe the character's name was Wes. 
But Vernon Wells with the mohawk, just a memorable villain. Who I did they don't have much dialogue. Even Max himself doesn't have much dialogue, but they have presence. Screen presence. That's what's missing in a lot of movies today. Not a lot of people have a screen presence where you they walk into a room and it's like, who's that guy? There's Mel Gibson does have a charisma to him. I've said before, there's a reason why he became a movie star. And Max is a badass in this movie. And people will say, well, he's not really the star of the film. Then who is the star of the film? Because he's there at the beginning of the film. He's there at the very ending of the film. He's kicking ass. I mean, the bit, most badass scene in any film, in the Mad Max films, I should say, is him leaning out with a barrel, double barrel shotgun and shoots it right into a windshield, blowing up a fucker's head. Just blowing a head, a head off through a windshield. That's the most badass scene in any Mad Max film that Max does. And it's in this movie. I mean, even starts with a chase. Max didn't chase. People are on him. He puts on the brakes. One shoots Vernon Wells. Um, uses Nitro and his interceptor, which I like the way the car looks here than in the first film. The first film, I didn't like the fact that it was painted yellow. Here, I don't know, I just, I like the way it looks better in this film. The Interceptor seemed like a badass car. I love his dog. Almost looks like a dingo, but I just, I just assume like this is Australia. But I love the look of the dog. I thought they did. I even liked the dog. I mean, the dog was a character that was memorable, and I was pissed when they killed the dog. Really pissed. I'm like, that sucks. They shouldn't have killed the dog. <laughs> Just love the look of the dog. So I love the. I, I would love a dog like that. I'm not even a dog fan, but a dog like that I would love to have. But you able to <clears throat> use nitro and fucks up two of them. And there's always scenes I remember when Max is getting gasoline. You have sort of a creepy moment. Where you just hear screaming, and then just a hand reaching out, and then clenching in the last bits of his life. I don't know, for some reason I remember seeing that as a kid and being a little bit creeped out by that. And Max finds a little music box, uh, meeting the gyro captain, who has his little heli sort of helicopter type of thing. <clears throat> uh, Bruce Spence. I thought he did a good job as the gyro captain. Wants to get into Max's car, and I like Mel Gibson. It's booby trap. Touch those tanks and <laughs> I like that he makes the sound of that. Not just booms. Like, touch those tanks and <laughs> and Yeah, but just the little stuff. And yeah, I love the, the dog after he's able to get the gyro capture and tie him up. Yeah, the dog has this wire attached to his double barrel shotgun and this moment where he sees a rabbit and Bruce Spence freaks out but the dog still keeps a hold of it and <laughs> stares the shit out of Bruce Spence. Uh, even little scenes like that give the film character and a bit of humor that works. And the film is about the settlement that has tons of gasoline and you have the bad guys going around kind of like circling the wagons around the settlement. Lord Humongous and Vernon Wells and such want it. Max is watching eating dog food and I like that he is he's eating dog food even the dogs watching and staring at him. How Max gets in there is that he watches this vehicle tried to escape and Vernon Wells kills one, they're tearing the clothes off this woman and she gets killed. Mass comes up, fucks up one, brings the injured guy back, gets into the compound, but the guy dies of his injuries and they don't trust Max. Lord Humundius. I, I like the way this world looked. Like the first Mad Max, I didn't really get much of the way this world looked or, or felt or acted. It was just, here's some weight, here's some desert, some people in cars, and that's it. Here I got more of a character. I mean, the look of Lord Humundius, 
and some of the other people, some who have Mohawks, and uh, just the, for example, having this, where they tie up people, which I'm, I saw in the Trails of Fury Road, they brought back, but they tie up people to the front of their cars, or they have people strapped to the hood of their car, dead bodies strapped to the hood of their car, which is not a normal thing you see in movies, but I thought it was an interesting touch. And even the feral kid who has his boomerang, the sharpest shit, throws it, kills Vernon Wells' Dow. Uh, one guy with glasses tries to catch it, gets his fucking fingers chopped off, and the bad guys laugh at him. That's what I mean, like, a scene's with a little bit of character to it, a little bit more to it. Just the fact that the other bad guys are laughing their ass off that this guy did his fingers cut off because of the boomerang. And Mel Gibson might not have much dialogue, but when it's there, it's memorable. If you want to get out of here, you talk to me. Yeah, I need enough gas to the carry. I know a place. Goes off, finds the gyro captain again. I like the scene where he finds out that the shotgun was empty all that time. And Bruce Spence goes, that's dishonest. No. And pretty much gets help from him, uses that chopper to find this vehicle and drive back into the compound, fighting off some folks. Again, the action scenes are well done. This goes at a fast pace. And I forgot how short this movie was. This movie is only an hour and 30 some minutes long. For some reason, I thought this was a two hour movie, but it's only an hour and 30 some, some minutes long. It goes by at a very fast pace. I did not get bored at all watching this film. And even when he gets back, they try to attack the compound, even just to a point where Max gets on a flamethrower, able to burn one fucker. Vernon Wells got in, and he's fucking up people. He escapes, some nice stunt work. He's like, hey, I did my bargain, I did the deal, I want to get out of here. But he gets fucked up, his car crashes, they kill his dog, I get pissed. He had a bomb, like a, a booby trap to his car, which erupts, kills a few people. The gyro captain able to pick up Max, bring him back, heal him up, and hey, they killed his dog, they fucked him up. He's going to drive the truck, which is pretty much the plan. He's going to drive this tanker that has gas in it, and while they're driving, these other people are going to escape, and you find out at the end, they actually have the gasoline. The tanker truck really has sand in it, and is used as a decoy. Which I get the idea they didn't tell Max about that. Because there's a scene where he, he looks and he sees the sand and he's filling up his hand. So, get the idea that he didn't know that he was being used as a decoy. I guess they didn't want to spill the beans to him about it. And then you get the finale, which is a great finale. Because George Miller did a great job directing this film. Even the scene, stuff with the camera work. I love the scene where, I don't know if they used a helicopter or what, or a crane, or a crane that was moving on a vehicle, where it's on top and it's going over all the vehicles as they're heading this way. It's just going all over them up to the tanker truck that Max is driving. I think for a while I'm thinking, well, it's just Max driving. It's he's not. It's not fisticuffs. It's not running over fifty people. But yeah, he's driving. He's trying to keep control, he's the decoy, he's trying to survive, and he's fucking up people with a shotgun, so that's more, that is, he is doing stuff. So I don't know what I was thinking uh, back in the day, but he is doing stuff. And this is rated R, and you see a little bit of blood, but 
Mad Max films were never the goriest type of movies, never that kind of violence. And you get a lot of cool stuff. You have the gyro captain throwing some stuff at some cars. You have some people on the tanker truck. You have this woman whose name is Warrior Woman shooting some and then she gets shot. You have a guy who's throwing some Molotov cocktails. And when the good guys get fucked up, they get fucked up royally as well. Uh, you have this one guy, the actor's name Michael Preston. He did a good job as sort of the leader of this group. The guy who has a positive outlook. And at the end, he gets a big old steel spear right into the back. Or well, the guy who gets hooked and gets pulled down into this explosion. Like, damn, these guys get fucked up. But Max fucked some stuff up, too. Again, leaning out with a double shotgun right through a windshield to a guy's head. And two get on him. He shoots one in the face, shoots one that's on top of his vehicle. Nice double bill shotgun fun. The feral kid is helping him out a bit. Um, Max hits one vehicle, which then goes into two or three vehicles. Great start, which I don't... I remember reading somewhere this wasn't supposed to happen. When the guy hits and you see a guy flying some assault in an air. For some reason I remember reading somewhere that wasn't supposed to happen and that was a mistake and thankfully the guy survived but that is a crazy stunt. Like you get some really good stunt work and that's why I'm worried about watching Fury Road because Mammoth Fury Road just seems like the ending of this film but for two hours and it's going to result in comparisons, which I'm like, I'm sorry, I might not have seen the film yet, but I know I'm going to like this film more, because I like Mel Gibson more than Tom Hardy as an actor, and I, I like the fact that there's no CGI in the film. Yeah, there might not be much CGI in Fury Road, but the little bits will take me out, I'm like, this did 100% pure octane for real. Even the death of Vernon Wells, who gets on the the front and just Mel you know, Gibson drives Vernon Wells right into Lord of Money is that great epic crash, sort of the you're stroked in and then that's just the orgasm <laughs> right in your face. Uh, just a well done sequence. Probably took a long time to film. And he comes out, he's all busted up, and realizes he was the decoy, you have the narrator, that the gyro captain became the new leader for this group, and they went off the safety, and the feral kid grew up, and he became a leader, and about how they never saw Max again. And I love the last shot, where you see pretty much this, and it leans back as he's right there on that long, lonesome road, forever to be the road warrior. I mean this really does have an epic feel to it. I mean the score, the the titles, the way they come up, the the cast, I think the cast, this is definitely the best cast of the three films. Then Mel Gibson does a great job, I like Bruce Spence, Vernon Wells, and uh, yeah, I forget the guy's name, Michael Preston the lady that played the warrior woman, the feral kid. Um, even when they don't have much dialogue, they're memorable characters. They got a bit of presence to them. They didn't overdo it with the humor, which I think is a problem with Beyond Thunderdome. They, it was just high octane action, fast pace, well done stunt work, memorable villains, great score, and a badass hero. Hero, anti-hero, however you want to call him. But The Road Warrior is a classic, and I understand now why, after watching this today, why it took me so long, I don't know, but I'm not just saying this just so I don't get yelled at. Believe me, if I did that, then I should have said The Exorcist was a classic, but 
no, I said in my review rant that I didn't like The Exorcist. There's a lot of a lot of popular movies I don't like. <clears throat> Nolan's Batman films, for example. Believe me, if I wanted to save some headaches, I would have just said, "Oh, I love them," even though I don't. This though, I do enjoy. I have no problems with The Road Warrior. It is a classic movie. <clears throat> like this is a smashing good time of the movies. Sheila Benson of L.A. Times. I get that. But anyway, thanks for watching. Take care. One more can I say about the Road Warrior? Sort of speaks for itself. And next up, we have Mad Matt Beyond Thunderdome. See you in a bit.